Um, I'll introduce myself, Scott Saunders. I'm SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, Chief Information Security Officer. I've been there about seven years now. Uh, actually was hired to implement what is the Critical Infrastructure Protection Standards. It's a mandatory regulatory regime for cybersecurity on protecting the nation's grid. Um, kind of an important thing. We all like to have lights. We like to have power. Um, we like to keep bad guys out of them. So I, I run the Information Security Office. Um, we've, we have uh, several analysts who are responsible for everything from um, pen testing, vulnerability assessments, doing uh, project reviews, uh, code analysis. Uh, we do a lot in um, evaluation of technologies. We work a lot with the federal government on uh, new technologies related to critical infrastructure. And uh, most lately I've been working on the President's Directive on uh, securing information for securing critical infrastructures, uh, executive order and developing the new framework for cybersecurity that all 16 critical infrastructures will be required to follow. And then the DHS Homeland Security Voluntary Program that will be implemented with that. So what I'm here to talk to you guys today about are two documents that we have authored in our sector um, over the past year and a half on risk management. Um, I found it very interesting coming from many years in state government, um, many of those in healthcare. Um, the utility industry was a very different animal. There was, uh, it's been running for many, many years. Um, pretty much it's always been this little isolated environment. Nobody's ever really looked at it. Systems weren't interconnected. Um, any communications were all over serial communications. They were long, a lot of the times they were just cable point to point. Um, that has been changing over the time, and so um, there's a lot of digitizing going on in, in the electricity sector today. Uh, recognizing we had the uh, Congress pass a law in 2005, the Energy Policy Act, that said we need to protect our nation's grid from cyber. We also decided that it was really important for us to probably, we can't do everything. We all know we can't secure everything. and. We, can't, we don't have unlimited funds, we don't have unlimited people, so we needed to have a really good risk model in order to, to evaluate what it is should be the investments we should make. The first document is the risk management process uh, that is put, we put together through the Department of Energy, who's our sector-specific agency in the electricity subsector. Uh, I'm gonna go over kind of what that document is and show you guys where you can get it. Um, and that feeds really into the, the capability maturity model on cybersecurity that we created. And I'm actually going to spend, I hope, a lot more time showing you that document. And I've actually created a sample um, document that we can go through. And this is available uh, by contacting the Department of Energy. You can actually get a copy of the Cybersecurity Capability module, Model. And this really helps you to first ha use your risk management to then frame um, your implementation of cybersecurity and be able to measure and then show gaps in your ability to um, to improve your model and to improve your uh, footprint for cybersecurity in your organization. So just so, some quick background. I'm going to run through these really sort of quickly. I mean, feel free to ask me some specific questions if you'd like um, so we can get to the, uh, the actual model. Um, but it, it was, it was public-private. So this was one of the very first times in our sector where the federal government and industry came together. There's about 30 of us who came to a room and spent uh, several months in DC rewriting uh, what was NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, everybody knows who's a, who they are, right? Uh, we rewrote um, 839, which is a guide to uh, cybersecurity. Um, we completely rewrote that document for the electricity subsector. I'm just kidding. Really what we did is um, the original document was 89 pages. Ours is uh, 40 some, some odd pages. So what we really did is we took it from an uh, academic discussion into a uh, an actual implementation. So it made it a lot better. So you can see all of our favorite friends that we worked with, everybody who has a favorite letter out there um, uh, who are currently, um, we're supposed to also be here with me. I was going to have some of our federal friends come with us. Um, but you know, that, that's, there's a little problem with them traveling right now. So they couldn't be here. We, um, 
we really wanted to frame this as it's about the organization and it's about the people. Um, so many times cybersecurity seems to be an IT problem and we want to make sure people understand it's more than an IT problem, it's a business problem. And it's a problem with the people we have in our business. Um, it's, we want to make sure we make informed risk decisions. We don't want to just say, you know, hey, that looks bad and be known as the people who always say no. As an ISO, I'm, I'm constantly told that, right? You only ever say no. And I'm like, well, actually, I usually say, well, maybe not that, but this instead. I guess it still comes across as no. Um, it's uh, the target of RMP is cybersecurity risk, but fundamentally it can be any risk domain. We, we actually, although we call it the uh, electricity subsector, you can remove electricity subsector and put in health sector. You could put in IT sector. You could put in manufacturing. You could do whatever you wanted with it, because that's really all we did is just change the name so it meant something to the people that we watched it. And we wanted to make it very clear in the document that we already deal with risk, guys. I mean, we're really not reinventing the wheel and anything that we're doing. Um, we, we deal with it every day. When we woke up this morning and we got on the freeway, we dealt with risk. When we got to work, we dealt with risk. Um, we always are dealing with risk. And, and so for people, it's not this whole mysterious thing that's out there. But what we have done in this document is make it easier to follow. So as I said, it's based on 839, and it describes the what. What is so important, um, what is so important is because we all work in different cultures and different environments of size and uh, investment and also mission. And so to, to, to create something that's so prescriptive in terms of how you implement something is not of much value because usually people walk around and go, well, I can't do that in my company. Well, that doesn't apply to my company. So what we wanted to talk about is the what, the outcomes that it is that you want to have. We, it's adaptable to any size or type of organization. In the electricity sector, most people have no idea there's 3,300 utilities in the United States. Um, about 100 of those are the PG&Es of the world, Pacific Gas and Electric, the really large investor owned. But more than 2,500 of those are really small companies, even smaller than SMUD. Uh, and so we needed to make sure that we wrote a risk management process that anybody could adopt, no matter how big or how small. And so what's great about this document is if you're a small 100-person uh, company or 100-person department, or you're just a department within a larger organization who wants to implement risk management, you could do that just for your own little group. And if you're a multinational company, you could do the same thing. It's just your program is just going to be bigger. So it's broken down into three areas. The three main areas of um, risk that you want to manage in the organization. To make it really easy, we have organization, we have the mission and business, and then we have information technology. And for us, we have what's called operational technology. That's actually our grid operations. Um, so IT and OT are those, those two industrial control systems or those two things in there. But you do it at the, at the organizational level, this is really getting your executive commitment, your executive buy-on, setting that tone from the top, understanding what's going on, what's important to the executives of your organizations, getting that executive buy-in. At the mission and business, this is the, these are the folks who are actually doing the work. These are, this is your biz, lines of business, your, your operations. Uh, this might be you know, your HR group. It could be... Um, um, you know, in a healthcare setting, you know, it could be, you know, some floor in a hospital. Uh, these are really where the work is going on. This is understanding what's important in that group of the organization. And at the bottom tier is a tier that we're always most comfortable with, and it's the tier I grew out of, which is the information technology group. These are the people who are actually touching the systems. And if you notice, as a, we use a pyramid for a specific reason, because as you go further down in the organization, the work is really where it's taking place. And IT is usually at the, uh, where all, a lot of the work is taking place. But we did add two arrows to the side of that. We want information to flow down from the executives. And what we want them to flow down to us is what is their risk profile? What's their risk tolerances? What are you willing to accept? Also, what's important to you? But at the same time, we want to flow that same information up. Because what's interesting in an organization, it's interesting when I came to SMUD is, I had my own envision what I thought was important in a, in a utility. Executives had their vision of that. We needed to get together and exchange ideas so we could find out where we had the commonalities and if there's something I needed to learn as well as there was something they needed to learn. So we created this pyramid, which is really like a nice circle. And you see that in the next part of the framework. We have four cycles that occur in the framework. We want to frame, assess, respond, and monitor. Framing happens at each one of those three spots. What framing is, it's really getting that understanding of what, what are the business practices you're looking at, what are your risk tolerance. The second part is assessment. 
we actually are continuously doing an assessment at each one of the areas. That assessment then leads into a, a respond. And the risk assessment is, so the executives have said this business process is super important. You get down to the mission and business and they're like, really? You think that's what keeps the company going? You get down to their area, they do an assessment of what was provided to them by the executives. Their response typically is, we need to have a discussion about really what runs this company. And a lot of times, things will change. That's why we have that continuous loop of the cycle. The last part is to monitor, because everybody knows change is inevitable. We just had change just a second ago, and now we're changing again, right? So monitoring is really important, and we want to feed this cycle continuously. We want it to not be a static environment. We want to constantly be looking at what is our, what is our environment, constantly assessing to make sure that environment uh, is operating as we expect it to, develop response strategies to ensure that uh, we are continuing in the path that we wanted to and that we don't have some anomalous activity taking place and then we want to monitor for change. So here are the words that go along with pretty much what I said but um, uh, just again just from a risk framing assessment response and monitoring it's four things that you have to do that's kind of we try to break it down that's really what this is supposed to show is it's really like four things and those four things inside the document we we go into a lot more detail but here you see kind of it put all together in the in the from the document from the process perspective you you have the cycle occurring at each one of the three tiers you have communication occurring at each one of the three tiers so the things that you might be doing, um, the activities you're doing at each one of those three are different. At executives, it's more of a meeting, it's kind of general, it's, it's very much discussion oriented. But by the time you get down to the information technology stage, you're doing penetration testings, you're doing security configuration management, uh, you're setting baselines, you're uh, procuring equipment, you're life cycling equipment, uh, you're doing all kinds of great stuff as you go down, down the, uh, the pyramid. So why should you think this is important? Here, I'll tell you why it's important. Uh, it will, you will make better informed decisions. What we did, we, we implemented this at SMUD right after it was developed. Um, it really got us engaged in the organization that um, typically power operations was an organization that was left alone. They run the grid, they're super important, they're kind of the ninjas of the electricity industry. And it really got us from an information security viewpoint into that organization to, to work with them, but also exposed them to some of the new threats and vulnerabilities that were out there and, and the fact that there were some concerns. It can, it can really lead to sustainability um, of your overall program. Because if you're constantly just living in 1970 and the rest of the world is moving forward, the ability for you to have any relevance kind of goes away. And so even me, who came to SMUD six years ago, I am not in my program doing what I was doing six years ago still today. Most, a lot of those processes have all changed. Some of them have gone away and some new ones have come on board. What risk management can help you to do is identify what those changes should be and making sure that you are addressing them as the business changes. The other thing we're really hoping from our sector is this has created a conversation among all utilities now as a consistent method of doing risk management so that between utilities we can get a better grasp of what is the security posture of our sector. And a lot of that is because I'm sure you all read the newspaper and New York Times is really good. They really love the electricity sector. They're always saying how good we are. Well, actually they're not. They're usually saying how the grid is at risk and everything bad's about to happen. What, we're, what this has helped us to do is be able to frame that conversation and help our customers as well understand what are the risks that are out there and how are they being addressed. So as a State Department, this could help you in that conversation of what are you doing, uh, especially if you happen to be you know, unfortunate behind a breach. This could help you manage some of that risk management stuff. It goes along with that. All right, so that's risk management. Any questions on the document? the end we'll give you the links to it. I didn't want to get into a lot of detail of it because it's so unique in terms of how you implement it. But what I really wanted to do is talk about capability maturity. Because what's important about capability maturity is it, is, um, it allows you to measure. And what's so hard to do in our, sec in our domain is to measure our performance. Having metrics around how well am I performing. I know I get the question a lot from our board of directors and our executives. Don't we have enough security? The employees are complaining, vendors are complaining, 
Um, don't we have enough? You, your budget seems to keep going up, but I don't ever see anything in return. And I usually say that's good. You shouldn't see anything in return because that means something bad happened. So it, the capability is important. Again, this, we did this right after RMP, after the risk management process. We went to Carnegie Mellon though. I don't know how many people are, are familiar with Carnegie Mellon University. Really nice university back east. Uh, they actually have what's called the Capability Maturity Model Integration, CMMI. We actually took that, licensed it, and then kind of cut it down a little bit. Because CMMI, there's a whole certification you can get to CMMI. It's a very long process. It's actually really, really, really detailed. Uh, you, you folks have heard of COBIT. COBIT's another, they have kind of maturity models as well. So, this, so we took this and said, well, we don't really have 10 years to do a capability maturity. We actually want to do something, what are the things that we got to do? So we came up with a much smaller environment. So we wanted to, de to develop something that would allow us to first strengthen cybersecurity, enable evaluation and benchmarking, again, metrics. And I know so many people are afraid of that word metrics. I don't, don't be afraid, it's a great word. It's not measuring how bad you are. It's actually using, you can use it against, use it uh, for you, not against you. It's like auditors, they're your friends. You can have them say things that you've said yourself but nobody seems to listen to. Um, it also allows us to share knowledge and then prioritize actions. And when I open the report, you'll quickly see about prioritizing actions. We did 10 domains. Anybody in here is CISSP? You've heard of ISC squared. Well, this sort of kind of follows it, but not really. Um, but we did, we did want to keep 10 domains. 10 domains is something that's really, really common. Everybody hears those words. It seems to resonate well with them. But the 10, 10 domains, we really, we wanted to focus on what are those core practices of a, of a security program that you would want to see. Risk management is number one forefront right there. So much of everything we want to do, try to get to is risk management, not just knee-jerk reaction, not just let's go buy a nice shiny toy, because nice shiny toys have to be managed over time, and if they're not, they become bad things in your organization. Asset management, you got to know what you have. If you don't know what you have, how are you going to protect it? Uh, identity and access management, if you don't know who you have, how can you protect? Threat and vulnerability management, you need to know what's coming at you, right? And you need to know what you have that you can or cannot mitigate. Situation awareness, this is really like talking to everybody in the world, like what is going on? What systems are impacting my organization? What attacks am I seeing? Information sharing and communications, guess what? Your neighbors are your friends because they might be having things happening to you that could be happening to them that could happen to you. If you guys tell each other about it, you might be able to find some systemic attack that's taking place. And that's really important. Incident response, because come on guys, something bad's gonna happen eventually. Supply chain, external dependencies management. For me, this is like, I, I have to go through this part fast because this is a pet peeve of mine. Supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. It's our biggest threat that we have. We don't know where stuff's coming from. So much stu stuff is built off, uh, uh, offshore. A lot of development is done offshore. What do you know is going on offshore? Supply chain is very important. Workforce management, do you know who you have working for you? Not only do you know who they are, but do you know who you have? Do you know where their background? Have you done any evaluation on these folks to make sure they might not be bringing some va uh, value added features in their background? to your organization. And then overall cybersecurity program, do you have assigned workforce for cybersecurity practices? And a lot of times, you don't. A lot of times it's 10% somebody's job at the bottom. We're getting a whole lot better now, and some sectors are a lot better, but we wanted to, to really make sure that we had a good program. The next thing we did is said, well, we have to measure. Of course, we have to measure. So we came up with, um, what are four levels? Zero being you're not performing it. Zero is always null, so no matter what, always have, you always got to have a, a, a null set, right? Initiated, meaning that I'm doing something. You have to have performed, which is I'm doing it. You know, I, I, I'm, I might be doing it, I could be doing it better. And then you have managed, which means it's implemented, it's institutionalized in my organization, it's repeatable. And then we have a reserved for um, folks who go above and beyond and they wanted to have some area to show that they were even better than everybody else. And we can measure across all 10 domains those practices that are going on. So an example, just a, a, of an illustration of um, access changing configuration management. 
Um, access control activities may include, there are things like, do you have unique accounts? Does everybody have a unique account or do you still use shared accounts? We still use shared accounts in some environments, right? and they're just going to be there, right? And if you're a Windows user, you know you have a local administrator account and, and all that great stuff, right? So the question is, how do you manage that, though? Now that you know you have it, how do you manage it? And so from a maturity perspective, uh, at a level one, you might have um, some access requirements. Those for, you might have some stuff for remote access. You might know who has remote access. Uh, at, at MIL2, you might actually be managing root privileges, administrative access. You have documented procedures and policies on emergency access, on the use and access in, of shared accounts. And at MIL3, you're actually being proactive, right? You've now saying, I am monitoring for anomalous access. I have a security event monitoring solution. I have ID, IDS and IDP running. I have whitelisting. I have all kinds of fun stuff that are going on at MIL3 where I'm, I'm truly managing and institutionalize that activity. Or like me, I have, a, I have a password vault. So if system administrator needs a shared account, they have to check out access. So that, acts, that, root, that shared account, they're now given a unique account. It's assigned to them for a period of time. They use those credentials. So if I need to go back and say, who used this account this time, I can go back to our vault and say, here's who's doing that. So we also wanted to show that, guess what? We can do it against threats. Everybody know who at Shodan is? This is a really, this is electricity sector specific example, um, but it's also awesome, it's a great story. Shodan is a really cool website. I don't recommend doing it at work, but you can go do it at home. It's a website that shows currently available control systems accessible across the internet. Super awesome. So if you want to find out what control system, you would like to turn off some water, maybe turn on some chemical plant, or I don't know, turn off an electric grid, Shodan is one of those sites that you can use to do that. Um, it's a site that we constantly monitor um, for uh, misconfigurations. And, uh, uh, but we want to do, there's a, Shodan's a risk to our organization, right, as the electric utility, for sure, it's a, it's a risk. Um, so we wanted to show how something like Shodan could be, from an attack vector, in, integrated into the, into the capability maturity model so that you could see, not only is this measuring my program performance, but it's also measuring what, how, a, how a, a threat might affect my environment. So are things internet accessible? Is a control system internet accessible? I'm going to ask this question number one, and if it is, I'd say stop right there and pull that plug first. Then you can worry about the rest of the stuff. Uh, remote access, who can get across it? Um, can, are there any brute, ax, brute force attacks that are capable because of Shodan, right? Now that it's accessible, I can target it. It's got an IP address. Anything with an IP address is an endpoint that's accessible. So am I monitoring for that? And um, by the way, have I looked up lately NVD or I don't know, even called the vendor to say, hey, by the way, are there any patches I should have installed right now? Um, and so am I doing any threat management? So how many people are going to go look at Shodan? How many people have already looked at Shodan? Thank you. I knew you two. One of you two are going to do it. It's very interesting, isn't it? Tons of them. Yeah, I, you know, uh, um, uh, our friends at Homeland Security are, are monitoring that as well, and they um, will call those utilities and have a discussion with them about it if they can identify who they are. Um, it's, uh, it, that, that's a pretty scary site, and it's publicly available, and they maintain it like crazy, the, our friends. Well, let's just say, so here's the, here's the truth of the matter, right? It's an IP address available on the internet. So do you know whether or not it's hardened? Do you know whether or not it's been protected? I mean, some of those might actually be protected and protected systems. Some of them might not be. So the fact that you have a control system that can effectuate physical change over a cyber communication Probably not cool. Just basic from our perspective. All right, threat and vulnerability management. Um, whether or not you are gathering information from trusted sources and uh, how are you doing that. Um, we use the Electricity Sector Information Sharing Analysis Center. If you're state government, many of you know about multi-state. 
um, sharing, information sharing and analysis centers, you probably call them a lot. ICS CERT, our friends at Department of Homeland Security, we talk to them a lot. We want to show information sources. So from a, from a maturity perspective, you would say information sources to support cybersecurity are identified. Identified, it's like, hey, I know I should call ICS CERT. So I, I'm at a mill one because I know I need to do it. But as I progress through mill three, I have continuous penetration testing, vulnerability analysis, constant communication, bi-directional communication. I'm talking to my neighbors, um, my other utilities, or my other friends, my other businesses. I'm talking with the federal government. I'm talking with our local office, FBI offices. I'm doing all of this other stuff. And that, that's kind of how you show maturity. And as I open up the report here, you'll get, a, get an idea of how we go about doing that. So Night Dragon, Night Dragon was an, is another electricity sector specific approach to doing this. Everybody know what Night Dragon was? Night Dragon. <laughs> um, so Night Dragon was an awesome APT that was put out. Um, I think uh, McAfee is the first one that found it. Um, its whole, whole idea was about uh, exfiltration of data, which is what most APTs are really after, is ex exfiltration of data. But this actually targeted electric utilities and said, I want information about the configurations of utility systems. And it was a really, really cool tool. Really cool tool and really cool signature. But you could use, we use the um, capability maturity model to say how would I defend against a night dragon attack? What are, what are the practices inside the domains that I could use to say, hey, I am protecting against night dragon. And you know, social engineering, social engineering, the greatest way to get you know, people to do something bad, but do you have a cybersecurity awareness program? That's like number one right there for, a, for workforce, right? Um, from an asset, do I get rid of default configurations? Do I get rid of default passwords? All that kind of fun stuff. From a threat perspective, do I, do I know what my exploits are? Um, and do I have sources of information? You understand sources of information is probably like one of the important things to, to know in, in all of this. And it shows up in, in every single one. So in our components of the model, understand, evaluate, prioritize, and plan. So the model lets us go through. We ask a bunch of questions. We're about to go do that. The evaluation tool spits out a beautiful report, which is awesome. But the re what's really awesome about the report is the ability to prioritize and plan. And I'm going to show you guys here in just a second, I promise. Just a couple more slides. This is kind of a sample of what the report looks like. You've got these nice little dials at the top. They'll show you green where you've done awesome stuff, and it'll show you red where maybe you have opportunities for improvement. And where is its future potential? Because we really have been, we've been pitching this to multiple sectors, actually. Uh, all of the different sector coordinating councils that make up the 16 sectors are, are now participating in their creating of their own version of the capability maturity model. But it's really a way for us to have a single conversation on best practices. What are our capabilities? And uh, can we measure capabilities across each other what a way for us to talk on the same language about practices. So many times, you know, you talk to healthcare and you talk to electricity and they say, well, we're different because we're healthcare and we're electricity. We don't, we don't do the same stuff. And if you break stuff down into this simple matter, you guys, we all really do the same, same thing. I mean, sometimes our implementations are a little different, um, but we basically do the same stuff. We all are going out there and doing vulnerability assessments. We're all doing asset management. It's all ex exciting stuff. Benchmarking is really important, especially for us being a regulated environment. Benchmarking and measurement is very important to us, right? Because once you become regulated, it's, there's a possibility for future regulations if there's a belief that you're not managing stuff. We want to be able to show how we are managing and how our regulations are actually helping to improve us. Vendor management, supply chain, giving them a roadmap to do something to help us. Please, 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 vendors, participate in the problem. Uh, so R&D investment. And the last thing would be training tools folks coming up, giving them something that they can, they can learn from. So with that, we are going to switch over to the PDF. So what I have now, and let's make sure I still have a mouse, is uh, actually the um, report form that we have. So this is a P uh, fillable PDF, and, and again, it says cybersecurity for electricity subsector, and you can just wipe that off, and you can insert whoever you wanted into that. It's got all of our friends' logos and all that good stuff. All the domains and all that good stuff, I'm just going to go past all that. It's all a great table of contents. So the first thing that you're given 
is just information about your organization and this helps us to um, you know, be able to characterize. Because one of the things in our sector is our, though what you see there are different lines of business in the utility, generation, transmission, distribution, and markets. Those are basically the four major lines of business. Those four lines of business all operate a little differently. They, they have different missions. And so we wanted to measure cybersecurity, not only of the utility as a roll up, but of each of the lines of business. And so you're able to pick, you know, which line of business are you, are you right now assessing, which is super fantastic. But here is where the total value hits. So we're going to start with the risk management uh, environment. And in risk management, it goes through and explains everything that's in the report about what risk management is. But what makes this so easy to talk to with everybody in your organization is, it really is this simple. Um, it's a list of questions in each of the domains. Is there a document risk management strategy? And you have, guess what, four, sort, four choices. Not implemented, which, think about it, maturity level zero. Partially implemented, maturity level one. Largely implemented, maturity level two. Fully implemented, maturity level three. So it's really, you don't even realize, right, if you're just sitting here doing this, you don't really realize that you've just now kind of benchmarked yourself in terms of maturity level. And the questions are so easy that you can pull together the different domains of, of people to ask that. And, and I actually filled one out and, and ran the um, statistics on it so you guys could see it. A uh, couple areas, so this is the, this is the great programmy stuff. Asset inventory, which, you know, I'll, I'll tell you from seeing a lot of these um, anonymized, that, um, you know, people do really good at asset management, but they do kind of poorly at, like, program management. Like, they'll do, like, the techie stuff really, really well, but you ask them to, like, you know, what are you doing to make, manage the processes of that techie stuff? Not usually so well. And it's kind of inherent in a technology people anyways. We're not really good documenters, at least. I don't know. Maybe I'm just me. But um, again, as you go through these questions, they also go from being ad hoc. If you notice the first couple, the end of them is ad hoc. That really, again, is kind of getting at that maturity level one-ish level, right? Um, as you go through, it doesn't always sequentially go through, and we kind of did that on purpose because we didn't want a lot of people figuring that out and going, oh, okay, if I just start at fully and go down to, to largely, then my report's going to look really, really good. So we, we tried not to do that so people couldn't like reverse engineer the, um, the statistics. I mean, you could, but... Um, but the last one here is inventory um, is related to the delivery of the function. What's, what's usually happens a lot of times is you might have um, inventory systems that are huge in your company. You might have it really, really huge, but nobody ever like ties that to like that's the business function that that thing supports. So when you get to like business continuity and disaster recovery and you're like, you pull out the inventory list and it's, you know, 4,000 things, you know, like, well, I probably don't need 4,000 things to get ready. So what you were wanting to do from an asset inventory perspective is say, so I've taken that 4,000 list of goodies and I've said, okay, these hundred are the ones that I need to worry about for this business function. And I've got that connection. All right, so you get an idea of the, um, the report. The, that's, that was the survey. So here's the final report of what you get. Uh, this is the uh, snapshot of what you get. And I'll show you the report, which is even more detail. Um, so here's like the access model. And you can see um, we have some pretty good green here, um, which is super fantastic. But you can see. In this, in this area, how each of the questions were answered to get to each of the maturity levels. But not all of them are so pretty. Actually, not all, there we go. There's one that's not so pretty. There's some color, some pretty cool color here. This is in the risk domain. You can see the pretty colors of, you know, red, pink, and kind of green. And, doesn't necessarily show up so well there, but you can see the different colors. What this shows you is, in your, in, if you just go all the way to the right, in your managed risk activities, you have two things that you could do. If you did two more things, you would at least be uh, largely implemented and, and your dial would get good, right? Which would be super great. But if you look at establishing a risk management strategy, something that a lot of people think they have, but when you actually get down, you, you, 
you typically don't have it documented, which is what we're after in the, in the domain, you can see there's a lot of opportunity in, in this domain for you to make improvements and for you to show where, where you could do um, the best bang for your buck. And so you could take the report and say, I want to I wanna make things better. In, uh, I think I had one near the end where I just had a couple things, yeah. So in information sharing, we typically do good stuff. There's a couple in here where you have on um, sharing cybersecurity information, you can find out what are those two that I need to do better at. So one C and one D. Um, so you know, if I did mill two, if I did these C and D on, on maturity level two, then I could be at maturity level three across my entire risk sharing domain. Now, the one thing the model doesn't do today that I, I do want to point out is make a determination of whether or not you should do that. We are working on a new version right now that allows us to say we don't have to do that because of the size or need of our organization. We don't do that. Yes? Is there anything that tells you, so here it says information share to stakeholders, whatever the rest of the Yeah. Um, is there anything that tells you how to implement it? So we, we give you links to common practices. That's exactly where we go. <laughs> so the only other, th the one other thing I want to show real quick is just a copy of the report so you can see how much more, and you get some of that detail in the actual report. Oops. Um, this is not the report. This, oh, maybe I did pull up the report instead of the spreadsheet. That's all right, too. Oh, I pulled up the report instead of the spreadsheet. So this is the report, but it does go into detail right here. There's also an Excel spreadsheet that you can manipulate to um, kind of do your, your prioritization. It does provide you context in the beginning of, of um, let me get to it, what, what you should be doing in the beginning of the area. Let me go, this computer is super slow, is it just me? Um, so we help you in the beginning of, in the beginning of this of, of where your linkages are. At the end of the document, we give you some sites that you can go to to get more information. And I always tell people, and I come from a federal government environment, I always tell people to go get NIST special publications because that's the best thing. They're really good and they're well established and then you can modify them to meet your needs. So with that, any questions? Any other questions? You want to have a, you can ask me anything and I will sometimes answer and sometimes not. Just put it out there. Questions? You guys love risk management? I absolutely love risk management. You don't love it? Come on. Excitement for risk management. No? Why don't you like risk management? Yeah, just out of curiosity. Okay. That is, that is hard, and it's taken me a long time to get the business folks to talk risk management. But when I talk to them in terms and say, you know, I'm actually here to help you, right? Because I'm helping you to prioritize so they don't come to you and say you have to do everything. I'm actually here to take some of those things off your plate. When I started to show people that that's what actually what I was bringing to them, they're like, oh, you're kind of a cool guy. Okay, I don't have to do as much work when Scott's around. And, uh, you know, that, that could help. Yeah. Questions? Yes. So it's a component. So our cyber, my cybersecurity risk management program is a component of our overall enterprise risk management. So on the enterprise risk management um, dashboard, my processes for cyber feed into that. And so I have my own, um, I have my own columns and my own areas of it. Uh, so they just, they just look to me to feed them that information. And then, you know, whatever my risks are, then fold up into the larger enterprise. So, uh, we have a separate, uh, and I do. So we have an enterprise steering committee, and then we have a cybersecurity steering committee. So that, um, and we also have a compliance steering committee. And so the, our three work groups work together um, to make sure that um, we're managing the different risks, because they are different risks. Ultimately, the enterprise performance management is what we call it, but the enterprise risk management group is responsible for making sure that you know, as we go down the organization, we're accepting risk appropriately. 
or managing risk, I, responding to risk appropriately. I went right to acceptance because you know that's just one of the responses. So it's a so I set it at my uh, mission and business because I'm considered in that second tier. So I get a feed from our executives in terms of what the overall executive risk management tolerances are, and then I use that to feed what is acceptable from a um, from my mission in the organization. So we actually have multiple levels of that. Okay, that's a great question. So risk tolerance, um, how do I know what my response should be if I don't know how much of risk I'm willing to accept? And a lot of the books will tell you it's all based on, you, you want to do it based on numbers and dollars and cents. And I'm going to tell you from a practicality that's never going to work for you. So in, 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 our, in my organization, and in, in, in our sector, we use more softer terms of tolerances. And we have things like uh, ability to, to uh, serve power to our customers, um, reputational risks, um, regulatory risks, our ability, how much regulatory risk are we willing to accept, if any? And in our sector, we're not allowed to accept any by, by standard. So that automatically comes to, you know, we have no tolerance for risk there. So we've, we've made it a more softer conversation. There's very little dollars and cents that goes into a lot of what we do. And, and you know, the books will all tell you, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you can get down to how much money does this widget cost? And, and you know, money, People, you know, it just doesn't work in the, in the real world. So tolerance to me, um, what we do, um, reputation is super important to SMUD, and we have a very strong reputation with our customers in Sacramento County. So, you know, anything that would affect our reputation, there's very little tolerance for that. And so if we tie a risk to reputation, typically there's going to be funding or resources or some response to mitigate that risk. Does that help? It, yeah, it is a struggle, and it, you know a lot of times it'll take a long time before you get there too. Um, you have to find that thing in your company that's important to them. And uh, I've worked for some companies where it was just don't let me get in the newspaper. I'll do everything, but if the newspaper finds out, that's like the worst risk you could ever have. And so you have to find whatever that thing is. And I'll tell you, it, it's constantly shifting, right? That's why we have the cycles that are continuous. Because right now it might be, you know, don't get me in the newspaper. And tomorrow it might be, um, you know, don't let some community organization come in and start picketing us for, you know, some reason, right? I mean, it, who knows what it's going to be, but you've got to constantly be, be finding that. And as your management changes, so do those tolerances, always. Hmm. Questions? Silence. All right. Well, thanks, guys. So, you have a question? The PDF, yeah. So, I, I, I couldn't do it here. I had to do it in advance. So, at the bottom of that PDF, it generates an, XML, an Adobe XML file that you import into an Excel spreadsheet. And then you export that out to a, um, P, a Word document or another PDF. But you have to have the full version of Adobe to do it. And I knew I wouldn't have full version of Adobe to do it here, so I, I did it for you. But yeah, it does it all for you. It's all there's an import and an export. Yes, it is. And I should have left that. If you send an email to es-c2m2 at doe.gov, you will get a nice response from Jason Christopher, <laughs> who is the program manager at Department of um, Department of Energy in Washington D.C. And these slides are up on the thing too. And there's actually some additional slides I added as um, some background. I just didn't. I just cut them out from here, but they're in the slideshow, so you, um, you have even more information than what you get to take away. Um, but you can talk to them. And uh, DOE is very interested in seeing this model adopted across all sectors. It's actually uh, one of the core documents inside the president's executive order that we're putting forward for the new framework because um, we, we think there's just so much value. And it's, while it has some cyber, some electricity specific words in it, we're creating a version that doesn't. So it, it'll be more just generic. All the same content, just take out operational technology and electricity. 
you can ask for the toolkit. So you can go get the, so if you just, if you just Google ESC2 M2 on the internet, you can get the actual document, but to get the tool set, the survey, the, uh, the report generator and all that good stuff, you have to ask DOE for right now. But it's freely available to government, it just can't be used for commercial purposes. That's our license, that's the license agreement with our friends at Carnegie. Any other questions? So we didn't, and um, the reason for that is because this really all started with a directive from the White House a few years ago in our sector um, as a response to some legislation. And so uh, we actually, the federal government's partnered with Carnegie Mellon already. They do a lot of R&D for the feds already. And so we just went right to them to give us something to use. All right. Now I had two people say it's time for you guys to go to the close out. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you guys listening. Thank you.